Open up your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> it's going to be real easy this morning. One verse. I tried. Verse 11. Let's pray before we start. Lord, we just want to take this time right now and uh, cleanse our hearts. Pray that you'd forgive us uh, from our, our shortcomings, the sin uh, that, that so easily entangles us, Lord. And I pray that you'd clear our minds, open up our hearts to your word. That you'd help us to just soak this in, help us to pay attention to what you have to say to us, that, that as each and every word that you say to us this morning that would just be captured by our spirits and that you would uh, change us, do a work in us this morning, and, and continue to draw us near to you. In Jesus' name, amen. First Peter 2, verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. So Peter now is addressing us in this verse, first word is beloved. And it comes from the Greek word agape. Those who are divinely loved by God as only God can love us in an agape way. We are loved by God. And I don't want to just gloss over that first word, beloved, and, and keep going. I want to stop there for a second and just soak that in for a minute. We are loved. You are loved by God. And you can't even fathom the love that God has for you. And I think it's important for us to recognize that. that Though we fail ourselves and him sometimes, his love never changes. His love never departs from us. That love, that deep and abiding agape love for us is always there, always present. Even when we may feel unlovable, and undeserving. He loves us. And Peter reminds us of that here, that we are loved with an agape love by God. And he says, as he goes on in this sentence, I urge you, I exhort you as sojourners and exiles. There's another reminder from Peter that we're not from here. We're not of this world. Both of these words, the sojourners and exiles, are, are close in meaning in the Greek very close in meaning, basically those who are passing through, who may live close to others, but are temporary dwellers amongst them. Does that make sense? So if you're a sojourner, or you're, you're an exile, you may be living near someone, but you're not really a part of their community. You're kind of separate from them. Temporary dwellers. We ain't from around here, we might say. That's what they said about me when I moved down here and I started working at Gulfstream. He ain't, he ain't from around here. And I'm not sure why, because they were the ones with the funny accents. But Peter here is really addressing the people that he's writing to as missionaries. It's really a perspective that he's trying to give here in this verse as sojourners and exiles. You're really missionaries here. People who have been sent somewhere for a specific purpose, right? That's what a missionary is. We may not have realized it, but we're all missionaries. Each and every one of us is a missionary with a calling from God. We're not of this world. We're citizens of heaven, and we're put in a place and given a calling by God to do a work for him in that place that we really don't belong. We're really not of here, but we're amongst people that live here, and so we're supposed to be doing a work based on the giftings that God gives us. 
And when a missionary is prepared and sent out by a church or by an organization, you expect them to live a little differently, don't you? To have a unique focus and purpose and a a certain lifestyle. So if we were to go to Africa and, and go visit some missionaries, you'd have certain expectations on how they would live, wouldn't you? Perhaps we'd expect them to see in some kind of grass hut with a thatched roof, living off the land, washing their clothes on the rocks in the river. I don't know. We kind of have these funny thoughts of what a missionary looks like. Oh, you're a missionary, man. That's, that's tough. I mean, you know, we've got, we've got a map back there with missionaries that we support. We talk about missionaries down in Roatan and missionaries that are working for Gospel for Asia. And we had Chuck and Yumi here. They're missionaries over in Japan. It must be a real strange life for them. But Peter here is saying that we're all foreigners down here. We're all missionaries. All sojourners sent on a mission. Followers of Christ sent to spread the gospel. To live the lifestyle of one who has a mission. That's really what a missionary is. Someone who has a mission. Not distracted by what the locals seem to be doing or what they seem to be worshiping. We don't get distracted by that stuff. We're focused on our mission. And it's a good thing, I think, a healthy thing to ask ourselves is, what is my mission? What really is my mission here? You know, as I've followed the Lord and prayed and fasted and read the Word and and as He's spoken to me, what has He revealed to be about my mission that I need to be focused on? And does my life resemble anything like what I read about in the early church for that set of missionaries in the book of Acts that were given a mission to start spreading the gospel? Disciples making disciples making disciples. And if we look at the focus in their lives, does does my life resemble anything like that life with somebody who had a, a really tight focus on a mission? So as we understand this verse, we understand that Peter is communicating here in the context that we all understand that this isn't home for us. Good to remind ourselves of that. This isn't home. This isn't a place to put down deep footings and build this large, long-term dwelling and build up a treasure for the long haul down here. This isn't what it's all about. This life here on earth is more like an entrance exam and a placement test for the life to come. We pass the entrance exam when we accept God's offer to turn from our sin and believe that Jesus died for our sins on the cross and rose again from the grave. That's our entrance exam to the next life. There's no works involved in that. And then we're given the gift of the Holy Spirit who guides us and gives us those spiritual gifts and the empowering to become a living sacrifice. So we're given this Holy Spirit that empowers us and gifts us, gives us gifts to become a living sacrifice so that we can have that mission. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? And as Jesus described in Matthew 25 in the parable of the talents, there will be a day where we stand before the Lord to give an account of what we did with those gifts that we were blessed with by God. We get to give an account. To me, that's not a negative thing. That's a positive thing to look forward to. We get to live our lives out in a way, and we get to go celebrate that life with Jesus because he gave us gifts, and we didn't keep them hidden and live that life here on earth like those people we're here amongst. We live our life here on earth like a missionary, like a living sacrifice. And when we stand before him, we're going to be asked to give an account of what we did with those gifts. I gave you those gifts. Now let me hear what you did. What we did with that investment that he made in us. That's really what that parable is all about. There was an investment made and Upon the return of the king, he wanted to know, that landowner, he wanted to know, well, what did you do with that investment that I made in you? A.W. Tozer said, before the judgment seat of Christ, 
My service will be judged not by how much I have done, not by how much I have done, but how much I could have done based on the giftings I was given. That's why Peter uses this language here as a sojourner and an exile to remind her, keep your perspective. That's why Jesus talked about picking up our crosses, keeping both hands on the cross so we're not picking up other stuff along the way and following Him. Storing up treasures where? In heaven. Store up your treasures in heaven, He said. That's why Paul said that he was forgetting what lies behind. Whatever happened in the past, regardless of how we may have lived our lives in the past, but straining forward toward what lies ahead, Straining forward like a runner, running for that tape, that finish line. That's what a missionary looks like. That's what a missionary looks like to me. That's what a follower of Christ looks like. We're not here to establish a lifestyle. We're kind of like foreigners who've been parachuted into a strange land, and our job is to devote our lives to using the gifts that God has entrusted to us and fulfill the purpose to which he's called us. Make sense? Fulfilling that purpose to which he's called us. And each of those gifts are different for us. Each of us has different sets of gifts. That's what's so cool as you see the body of Christ come together. So we all have different gifts, and, and that all fits together so well. We all can't be a foot or a little big toe. But God has given us gifts, different gifts, so we come together like a a tapestry like a garment, beautiful colors. The gifts are different, but I think the expectation for how we apply those gifts is the same for each of us. We all have different sets of gifts, but how we live out our lives, how we apply those gifts is the same. That intensity, that level of intensity that I think he's asking from us is no different for one to the other. So it's all about grace. Let's not forget that. What Jesus did on the cross for us. None of us would be in this place this morning if it weren't for grace. We could do nothing, nothing, nothing to earn our salvation. It's freely given to all those who believe. It's a miracle. Jesus took our sins on the cross because we can't earn that. We can't live that perfect life. We just take that hand that he holds out to us so that he can pull us up from those waves that are crashing over us and lifts us out to the top of the water. So it's all about grace. But to me, it's grace with a purpose. We're saved for something. He redeems us for something. We're bought with a price. And I think then we should live with a purpose. As an example, I'd like to do a little physics lesson. I know you guys love physics. There are two things in physics that sound like the same thing. Two metrics, two measurements. One is speed, and the other is velocity. You're loving it so far, aren't you? I can see everybody's just riveted. Speed and velocity. Speed is, some, is, is a metric that measures how fast something is going. Kind of makes sense. You want to know how fast something is going. So you can measure the speed of something that's just bouncing all over the place, but never really going anywhere. And speed measures the rate at which that object is moving. But it may not have really traveled any distance. It could just be moving around, and it's traveling at a certain speed. Okay, So we've got speed. That's over here. Velocity measures both speed and direction. There's two components to velocity, speed and direction. And so you can measure the speed of a car that's just going around in circles. Let's say that's going at 50 miles an hour, just going around and around and around and around. And around. It's going at 50 miles an hour, but it's really not getting anywhere. But you can measure the velocity of a car that is going purposefully in a certain direction to somewhere. Remember, there's two elements of velocity, speed and direction. Speed with a purpose. And to me, that applies here 
to what God wants to do with our lives. He gives us grace. He gives us grace. And we can do a lot of things with that grace. We can hold it inside and we can just bounce around and, and, and just live out our lives. But I think what I read here is that the Lord wants us to live out our lives, that grace that He's given us with a purpose, with a direction towards something for Him. That's grace with a purpose, as a continual sacrifice of praise, as a sojourner, as somebody who is passing through. It's a miracle when someone is saved. We rejoice at that. The angels rejoice in heaven when someone is saved. Someone is reconciled to their God. But when someone is saved and then lives their life out with direction and purpose as a sojourner and a missionary, just being a conduit through which God pours into other people, that is the life, that is the life God intended us to live. Right? We rejoice when someone is saved. But it is amazing to watch that, that life that's been redeemed turn into something that is lived out for a purpose. For Him. A sacrifice of praise. And that's the life that God intended for us during this brief time on earth. And then we go stand in front of Him and He says, well done, dude. Well done. Come and enter into the joy of your Master. And how cool will it be when we stand before our Savior on that day and just lay all of what He did through us. It's nothing that we do. We just lay all that He did through us at His feet. And He gives us a crown. And we, like the 24 elders, we just cast that crown at his feet. Because I don't want the reward. He gets the reward. He was the one that made it happen. How cool would that be? And the only thing we did, the only thing we ever really did, is say, yes, I will follow you. Yes, I have the gift of saying yes. You've given me the gift to be able to say yes. I'll follow you and allow you to work through me. That's all we can really do. We show up with that, and he does the rest. How we live our lives down here affects how we live our lives, how we will live our lives in the next life. Not laying down those rows of wood and hay and stubble, but rows of gold and silver and precious stones. Stones that will stand the test of fire. That's grace with a purpose to me. That's the abundant life that God means for us to live. So I go back to the passage again. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against the soul. So that next set of words, he's urging us as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. That word abstain in the Greek means to, to have one thing while separating ourselves from another thing. We're abstaining from something. We're doing without something so we could have something else. Peter is telling us as missionaries to keep ourselves away from the fleshly and carnal desires. Keep yourself away from that. That's just 10 miles of bad road. Put aside the pursuit of those things that the people we live among are so busy pursuing. Right? That's what we see. You flick on the television. You just drive down the highway and look at a billboard. You talk to your friends. There's a, there's a, they are consumed with that pursuit. Pursuit of those things that are carnal and fleshly. He says, put those things aside, man. Put those things aside by relying on the Holy Spirit to fill us with a desire to pursue things of the Spirit instead of the things of the flesh. Galatians 5. I'm going to turn there for a second. Verses 16 and 17. Paul is saying to the Galatians in his letter, <clears throat> Galatians 5, 16 and 17. Paul says, but I say, Verse 16, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Read it again. Walk by the what? 
and you will not satisfy the desires of the what? Right. So remember that Greek word means to abstain, to, to get away from one thing so you could move towards something else. Walk by the Spirit so you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. Verse 17, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. They're in contention with each other. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do, Paul says. And we all can identify with that. I know I can identify with that. There's all kinds of things that just get in the way from what I really want to do in my spirit, what the Holy Spirit wants me to do with my life. There's all this stuff that I keep getting tangled up by. But Paul is saying here, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That stuff just falls away when we're in that zone, walking with the Spirit. Thomas Brooks wrote that we need to see our flesh as a hook. It gives us an illustration. Our flesh, our, our own sinful nature as a hook. <clears throat> And see the world as the bait. In, in you there are wicked desires. We have these desires, that flesh inside of us. And there are, in the world there are wicked opportunities to feed those desires, to satisfy those desires. And they work together. All Satan wants to do is bait your hook with whatever feeds your flesh. And he, he knows what that is. And we're all different. And he's been doing it a long time and he's, he's really good at it. I'm here to tell you. So all Satan wants to do is bait that hook that is your flesh with whatever feeds your flesh. So he'll take everything from the world and put it on the hook of your flesh. And as long as you bite, he doesn't care. Satan will give people sex, money, fame, power, glory, whatever it is that hooks you. He'll give them what they want, and he doesn't care because his whole goal is just to get them to bite. And then he will reel them in to destruction and death. He's got you. You're down. Satan knows what to bait each of our hooks with. If we go to Matthew 4, even Jesus was exposed to that. Matthew 4 talks about, if you want to turn there for a second, I'm not going to go through all the verses, but I'm going to talk at a high level about what Jesus went through during his temptation. He spent 40 days out in the wilderness and didn't eat for that entire time. He spent it fasting. And as he's out in the wilderness, what did, he, what did he have to undergo? He had to go through a temptation by Satan. So even Satan was tempting Jesus. And, and Satan thought he had some things that perhaps he was... He could be exposed to that could bring him down. And so in Matthew chapter 4, we see Jesus in the wilderness fasting for 40 days, and he's hungry, and he's tired, and he's weak. He's vulnerable. Vulnerable. That's where Satan likes us. Satan tempted him first by telling him, if, if you really are the Son of God, already there, Satan loves to do that. A little accusation. If you really are the Son of God, Command these stones to become bread. You haven't eaten for 40 days, man. Why don't you turn these rocks into bread if you're son of God? And how does Jesus respond? He responds with Scripture. He says, man does not live by bread alone. So Satan, he sees well that one didn't work. So he takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple and told him, if you're really the son of God, throw yourself down. Angels will take care of you. And Jesus again responded with what? Scripture. He says, you should not put your Lord God to the test. Don't put your Lord God to the test. So then take him, Satan takes him up to the highest mountain, to the top of a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and said, all of these I will give to you. Satan had the power to give him all of the kingdoms of the world. Satan had dominion to be able to do that, make that offer. But he only does it with one condition. He said, all of these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. All this is yours. We can bypass this whole deal if you'll fall down now and worship me. And how did Jesus respond again? With Scripture. 
And he says, you shall worship the Lord God and serve him alone. I love it. Satan was seeking to hook Jesus with the desires of the flesh. He was hungry. He was desires to, the desire of the flesh to, to give him recognition as the son of God. And for power. To bypass that hard road that he knew was ahead of him. And each time, Jesus responded with Scripture. It was like Satan was trying to attract him with a magnet, and Jesus kept meeting that magnet with another magnet of the same polarity, and it pushed Satan away. That Scripture was a, like a, Satan had a positive pull of the magnet, and, Satan, and, and Jesus just answered it with Scripture, pushed him right away, each time. Because he was meeting a spiritual attack with a spiritual weapon. Not a fleshly one. You've got to remember that. If you're under spiritual attack, do not respond with a fleshly weapon. You will go down. You have to respond with a spiritual weapon. And Jesus responded with Scripture. James says, resist the devil and he will what? He will flee from you. That's exactly what the devil did. Resist him with the word of God. Resist him through the Holy Spirit and with prayer. Paul said in Galatians that these, are, these things are opposed to each other. That's what we just read. Like two ends of a magnet that are of the same polarity. And so back to our text this morning. First Peter, it says, As sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Those passions of the flesh that wage a war against our souls. So we understand as we see Jesus, even Jesus out in the wilderness, there's a war, there's a battle going on with him. We see how he resisted it. And there's a battle going on right now, right here, as we're here together. It's a spiritual war. We can't really see it all the time. Sometimes we can feel it. I know I can feel it. I know you can feel it. When you're under attack, man, it comes hard. But it's a spiritual war, and it must be felt, it must be fought on spiritual terms. And too often, I don't think we see the war itself. I think we just see the bloody aftermath of the battle. Because we're not in tune with what is going on. We're not paying attention as we're being taught here. And Peter's telling us, man, there's, you need to abstain from the passions of the flesh because they're waging a war against your soul. Be, be attentive to that. This is often a battle that's fought on the spiritual plane, and sometimes it, it takes place on a physical plane as well. We get sick. We get injured. We, the devil tries to take us out on our way to doing something. But most often, this is not a physical battle. It's fought against the soul, Peter says. It wages war against your soul. What is the soul? What is the soul? The Greek word there, it's spelled psyche, P-S-Y-C-H-E, pronounced suke, suke. It's where we get the word psyche in psychology. Literally means to breathe or to blow. You think of our soul as the seat of our desires and our feelings and our affections. Those three things. Our soul is the desire, the seat of our desires feelings, and affections. And the Bible refers to three parts of our being, doesn't it? It talks about our body, talks about our soul, talks about our spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May, you, may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul, in this verse, talks about a spirit, a soul, and a body. Three distinct things. We turn to Hebrews 4.12. Very famous verse. Talks about the Word of God, living and active and sharper than what? Any two-edged sword. Piercing to the division of soul and spirit. It talks about something being very closely linked 
The Word of God can pierce to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So one way to think of this whole concept is three concentric circles. The outside one is the body. The Greek word is soma. That's the part that has skin and bone and muscle. That's our, our tent that we've been given to live in on this world. That's that outside circle. The next circle in is the soul. That's what Peter refers to in this verse, the suke, the psyche. the seed of our desires and feelings and affections. It's the soul where fleshly lust, desires, and appetites arise. It's the part of who we are that you can't see or touch. You can touch the body. You can't really touch the soul. It's the part of who we are that you can't really see. It's the inner makeup of who we are. Lehman Strauss said we must be careful not to confound that which is truly spiritual and that which is merely soulish or psychical. What is from the soul? We have seen that the spirit of man is the sphere of activity where the Holy Spirit operates in regeneration. Just so is the soul the sphere of activity where Satan operates, making his appeal to the affections and emotions of man. So the body is physical. The soul is our personality, who we are, our emotions, and right here in this verse, this is where Satan is attacking us. Our fleshly desires. One verse, 1 Samuel 18.1. You don't have to turn there. 1 Samuel 18.1 talks about David and Jonathan. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul, it says. So they're, they were tight brothers. Their souls were knit together. Now let's look at the innermost circle, the spirit. The Greek word there is pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A. It also means wind and breath, but it also means spirit in the Greek. The Hebrew word is ruach. It has the same meaning. And the Holy Spirit in the Hebrew is the Ruach HaKodesh, right? Dr. James Graham says that the main theater of the Holy Spirit's activity in man and the part of man's nature which he is, has pecu peculiar affinity is in the spirit of the man. So we, we see here that Satan often operates in this area with our soul, with our affections, our desires. That's our, they call it our flesh, but it's really our fleshly desires. The Holy Spirit operates in this area. It's that part of us that lies mostly dormant until we are saved. And then the Holy Spirit comes in and communicate and have communion with us through our spirit. Turn to 1 Corinthians 2, please. Paul talks about this innermost circle of the Spirit within us. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11. He's explaining this and he says, <clears throat> For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person, which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Verse 14, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. Right? And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. When we read through the Bible, when we have come to save him and to follow him, the Word has a totally different effect on us than it had before, doesn't it? And it has a totally different effect on us because this whole part of our being has been illuminated now, has been turned on by the Holy Spirit. And that Word of God speaks into our spirit. The Holy Spirit communicates with our spirit. It's in communication and communion with us. 
So we have our body, our flesh and bones. We have our soul, our psyche, the desires and feelings and affections, our emotions. And then we have the spirit, that part of us that is God conscious. And this is the part of us that can relate to the spiritual world. This is the part of us that can recognize that there's spiritual warfare going on. We can recognize when we look at somebody, we can, we can tell that they're going through something and maybe we need to go up to them and pray with them. Or the Lord can give us a word that somebody might need to hear, a word of encouragement. This is the part that the Holy Spirit can communicate with us to. And it, and it talks to our soul and talks to our body when we allow it, when we're in communion with Him. And now the thing that hits me about this diagram, what's wrong with that picture? As I look at it, I don't like the fact that that's so small. And I think about somebody like Jesus. We talked about Jesus in the desert. I wonder what his circles look like. If we could have illustrated what Jesus looked like while he was walking on earth or even today, what are the size of his circles? Or Paul? What do you think the diameter of his spiritual influence was? The, the, what, how much he was focused on the spiritual life? And that's something that I, I, was, I was studying this yesterday, and I, I kind of walked away from the message, and I, I sat down with myself. I got some, you know, I, it was something I had to pray about. and something I want to focus on is I don't want this to be a tiny little spirit inside of me. You know? When people see me, when people are around me, when I'm around myself and can focus on myself, I want this to consume who I am. I don't want to be defined by, body, by my body and who I, how I look and how I dress and what I do for a living. I don't want to define myself by my personality, my affections, and my emotions because day to day, those are all over the place. I want to get to a point of my spiritual walk that this is what defines me. This is where I'm focused. That's where a sojourner should be defined, I think. That was my takeaway from this passage. As we focus our lives on what Jesus wants us to look like to him as missionaries in this world, with whatever gift we've been given, like Paul as he strains for that tape, that finish line, I want the spiritual part of me to be the primary part of me. Such that how I conduct my life, how I walk around, how I breathe each and every hour of the day, I am in touch with the Holy Spirit so that He can communicate with me, so that I can see what's going on spiritually. If you look at some of the prophets, you know, I think of Elijah and Elisha and how they were able to communicate and understand they had a certain gifting. But it's so cool to see how they operated in this spiritual realm all the time virtually. And as Jesus walked on earth, he walked around. Yeah, he had a body and he had a soul, but that stuff was kind of secondary, I believe. And as I look at the apostles and the, and the early church, I think it was all about that spiritual part. Because that's how God designed us to live. Not the spiritual part like so that, to me, is a cool takeaway from this, something that I, I've learned from this. I just wanted to share. Peter says here, the passions of the flesh, they wage war against our souls. Because I think our souls are so big. We've got so much, such a big hook out there for Satan to bait. The passions of the flesh wage war against our souls. And then there's this spirit within us that relates to us the things of the Holy Spirit. And they're at war with each other. And I think of that Cherokee legend, the Cherokee story about the two wolves. I know Pastor Dan used to talk about it. It's an old Cherokee legend. A grandfather who told his grandson that there's two wolves inside each one of us, battling. One is good and the other evil, and there's a constant battle going on within us. And so the grandson thought about that a little bit. And so he said to his grandfather, which one wins? His grandfather said, the one you feed. The 
when you feed. So as we wrap this up, I think the things to remember from this one verse that's such a, an amazing verse that has so much packed into it. We need to remember that we're sojourners here. We're missionaries here. We're not of this world. Just passing through. We have grace with a purpose. We're, we're heading in a direction. We have a focus in our lives that's focused on God. And we're living for Him with the gifts that we've been given. And we need to abstain from the passions of the flesh that war against our souls. Separate ourselves from them. Leave them behind as we grab onto something else. We need to feed the Spirit within us with the Word of God and time spent in communion with Him and with other sojourners. So that the line of communication between our Spirit and the Holy Spirit is strong and not disrupted by the static of this world. Say that again. We need to feed the Spirit within us with the Word of God and time spent in communion with Him and other sojourners so that the line of communication, the line of communication between our Spirit and the Holy Spirit is strong and not disrupted by the static of the world. And remember that we have been redeemed. We have been redeemed by the Lamb of God. We've been saved, we've been forgiven, and we've been given grace for a purpose, to truly, truly live out our lives as a living sacrifice to Him. We get to do that. What a privilege. Let's pray. Lord, we are so amazed at the work that You do, how You've just laid out this plan for us in our lives. And it's all so clear in the Word. And Lord, I just pray that you would allow the scales to fall from our eyes. <clears throat> and allow us not to be residents here, setting down permanent stakes into the ground and building up treasures here on earth, but looking to build up treasures in heaven, Lord. Help us to be sojourners. Help us to be feeding on your word and spending time alone with you in prayer and spending time with other sojourners here such that that communication line is crisp and clear and that spiritual part of us continues to grow so that it overtakes the rest of us. So Lord, as we walk around in our lives, our daily lives, the, the lives that you've called us to live, as we come in contact to others, that's what they come in contact with is that, that spiritual side of us, the loving side that has experienced your grace. We can share that because it's just pouring out of us. So Lord, my prayer is for each and every one that if they had not have committed themselves to live that life before, that they would do so right now and do some business with you, forsaking all that other stuff, understanding that we've got an eternal life, billions and billions of years to look forward to with you, Let's live out this brief time on earth, this, this passing shadow, this wisp of a life. Let's live that out in pursuit of what you want us to pursue using the gifts that you've given us. So Lord, we just celebrate this day. We celebrate what you've done for us by dying for us on the cross and giving us a new life. We're a new creation. And Lord, we just want to praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Luis will be up here if anyone likes to pray.